I'm sorry it came to that. The storm is coming. The Imperial throne lies empty. The scent of war swirls in the air. Evil awakens. A long vanished foe stirs. Those who would destroy Tamriel seek out dangers to their dark plot. It is the 582nd year of the Second Era. The drums of war are sounding. This is where our journey begins. My gaming experience has mostly been with single player PC games. I've come to appreciate other types of games like first person shooters and more action oriented games, but I still have a very strong preference for role playing type games. In particular, I've always been a big fan of the Elder Scrolls series. I've gone back and played the old classics like Morrowind and Daggerfall and loved them. Yes, I even slogged through Arena. So I was delighted to get access to the latest Elder Scrolls Online expansion. Special thanks go to Bethesda Softworks and Zenimax for the review key. Any opinions in this video are entirely the authors, and the footage is from the newly released High Isle expansion. What? If you like what you see, feel free to click on the link in the description to get more information on the game. The first thing you do is choose which region to play on. You can play on the North American or European servers. I'm in Australia, so I was worrying that both were a bit far away. But so far I haven't noticed any meaningful lag, even when fighting together with other players. So that's a big plus point for the game. The next step is to create a character. It seems that you can have up to 9 characters, and characters can't be transferred across regions. The High Isle expansion is set in a Breton island, and I've always played Breton characters in previous Elder Scrolls, because they're good at mixing combat and magic. The other race I tend to play is Dark Elf, for their distinctiveness. But there's no reason not to go Breton this time. So behold, Geraldo El Skip. He's Geralt the Rib's long lost and much dumber cousin. You'll be shocked to know that you start the game in a prison. You're awake. Oh, thank the stars. Yes, it's only happened in every single other Elder Scrolls game. The tutorial introduces you to fighting and other concepts like stealth and traps. Let's begin. Those of you who played Skyrim previously will be quite at home, because it works pretty much well the done. same. There's a few new additions to combat, as both you and enemies have area of effect and line attacks that resemble what you might see in games like League of Legends, just in a first person format. Most enemies you'll meet resemble those you'll see in Skyrim, but at the end of the tutorial, you'll face a boss battle. Near Bosses have a lot more hit points and tend to have powerful attacks. After that, you get access to gates that will take you to the various zones in the game. There's a number of open slots, so I'm guessing that there will be more expansions in the future. And this door leads to High Isle in the Sisters Archipelago. Our spies believe leaders of the Great Alliances will gather there for a peace summit, but this will draw conspirators. They could plunge Tamriel into deeper chaos, unless you stop them. Then of course, we're off to High Isle. 
High Isle feels so peaceful most of the time. That's why I like it here. A respite from all the chaos of the mainland. The temperature of the islands is quite unique. It facilitates all sorts of strange and beautiful things. Some precious cargo was supposed to sail in on the morning tide, but it never arrived. The people need to believe we have things under control. Long ago, we druids left Tamriel and its troubles behind us. But here, our ancient ways survived. I believe a knight should not be measured by the worth of their weapon, but by the allies they keep. These manifestations of the island's fiery hearts reveal the majesty and power of the natural order. Nature itself has fallen out of balance. Storm and fire will bring down the old. You'll be greeted by an NPC as soon as you arrive. This will kick off the main quest in the expansion. Fresh off the boat, eh? <laughs> High Isle is a good place for an adventurer to earn some gold, provided you have the right connections. Lady Arabelle will appreciate an outsider's perspective. She's at the Gonfalon Bay docks with Lord Bacaro. if you want to introduce yourself. The problem I mentioned, it involves some missing ships. The island is set in Breton cultured lands, so the look and feel tends towards a mix of medieval and classical architecture. Very civilized and all that, unlike those dark elves living in mushrooms. The largest city is nearby. It's quite big and very imposing. There's a massive colossus and many ships moored at the harbor. The inner city has a mix of large and small buildings. It also seems that you can purchase your own home eventually. There's also your typical weapons, armor, and consumable vendors, plus crafting benches. Since I didn't know anything about the game, I started doing the main quest immediately. My dock hands are watching for your cargo, Lady Arabelle. They know it's precious. There was a storm off the coast. Perhaps it delayed the ships. Forgive me if I do the job you hired me for, Lord Bacaro. You there, might we speak? I have a keen eye for talent, my dear, and you're practically oozing it from your paws. I am Lady Arabelle DeVoe. You're told to look for some ships that haven't come in as they should. But as you go about that, you'll meet a mysterious group of fighters raiding the countryside and causing all sorts of trouble. The first of the main quests will see you explore a bandit hideout, restore the lighthouse, and finally rescue the captains of the missing ships. Along the way, you overhear the head of the bandits. Down there, it's Quentin. Let's listen and try to figure out what's going on. A new age of peace is upon us. An age of free peoples standing together, not kneeling to distant thrones. This is not your war, General. What say you? The war took everything from me. I... I am with you. How can I help? The Order? And take care of a traitor. Here is your chance, Quentin. Stop these fools and strike a blow for the people. I'm sorry, Lady Arabelle, but I have made my choice. For the Ascendant Order! What's clear is that this is more than just a ragtag group of bandits. This is bigger than just some missing ships. And the plot develops as you proceed down the main quest line. So far I've only done two of the seven main quests. And I've already gone up about six levels just from that experience. As a bit of background, the game is set in the second era. This is an era of strife between the various regions. And the game reflects that with three alliances. You have the Bretons, Red Guards and Orcs in the Daggerfall Covenant. The High and Wood Elves plus the Khajiit form the Aldmeri Dominion. And the Nords, Dark Elves and Argonians belong to the Ebon Heart Pact. The factions are based on geography. But if you know the history of race relations in Elder Scrolls, it's a little odd that the Nords, Dark Elves and Argonians are in one faction, given that they've supposedly hated each other since forever. 
but I'm guessing that that's primarily a hand wave for the sake of having three factions paralyzed in PvP. The single player Elder Scrolls games are set at the end of the third era, after Tiber Septim has reunited the continent, and the Oblivion Crisis marks the start of the fourth era. So the online game takes place well before any single player game. But getting back to the main quest, these anonymous fighters raiding the countryside claim to want to end the wars and bring peace to the land. They refuse to show their faces and don't wear any emblems, which NPCs in the game say is highly suspicious. But Geraldo, he can be trusted. Oh, this is not good. Rigert needs help. First things first, Again. generally speaking performance has been flawless for me. I haven't noticed significant Hello frame drops below 60 I FPS, even when playing at fairly high graphical brush. settings, or any noticeable lag. It looks like the game will play very nicely on average games. systems. I started a new character for the expansion, and by the time I left the tutorial, I was at around level 3 or 4. So far I've done a couple of main missions, and a couple of side quests, and haven't had much trouble with combat, so it looks like enemies are level scaled to you. If you know how to strafe and dodge, you won't find combat too difficult. You shouldn't take bosses too lightly, but the only fight where I've died was one involving a boss well above my own power level that's meant to be tackled by a group. Enemies in the wilderness tend to stay where they are and don't follow you too far, so generally you're the one who chooses when to fight. Yes, you can also die from falling. Make sure to thank Geraldo for his sacrifice in discovering that. Even if you do die, there's no permanent consequences. You can either spend a filled soul gem to revive on the spot or revive at the nearest fast travel point. Well, if you don't want to do the main quest, in typical Elder Scrolls fashion, you can simply wander around oh, looking good, for NPCs with face. side quests. I have tried time All the quests are voiced, and there's often other return, NPCs that also have dialogue related response. to the quest. Would so you can speak to them for additional dialogue if you want, though it seems to be flavor text only. If you look at the world and the expansions released so far, the world seems pretty big. Over about 30 hours, I've only really explored a small part of the expansion island I'm in. And looking at the list of zones, it seems that there's so much more content out there that I haven't even touched, even within the expansion I'm in. The list of achievements and collectibles suggests that we're looking at hundreds, most likely thousands of hours if you want to explore everything. If you're mostly a single player gamer, it might take some getting used to seeing all sorts of shiny high level characters surrounding the quest giver, or zipping about with bears and other pets in tow. NPC enemies also respawn very quickly, so you should never assume you've cleared a dungeon. You'll have to fight the same enemies again if you go back after a few minutes. But they're also very unperceptive, so you can easily fight them in small groups at a time. Inventory also plays differently. Instead of a weight limit, you have an item limit. By default, outside of what you're wearing, you can carry 60 different item types, not the total number of items you have, but the number of different items you have. That means that dozens of the same item count as one towards the inventory limit. Sure, you have other places to you be, also so get a bank, where you can free. deposit your items for storage. You get 60 item types by default again, and you can access most of them when crafting. It might well be the case that buying a house will give extra storage, but I can't confirm that yet. Early on, the only storage you have is your backpack in the bank. You can purchase more slots on your backpack and the bank, but every slot upgrade costs more and more gold. Basically this means that you'll need to be strategic about what you take. You should avoid carrying lots of different types of food and alchemy reagents, use them before setting off to explore, or destroy them if you can't use them right now. There are some differences from the single player Elder Scrolls experience, but you'll get used to them quickly enough. And by and large, Elder Scrolls Online plays very close to Skyrim. There's abilities that give bonuses when used in combination, presumably by teammates, but I've found combinations in my own class that I can pull off by myself. 
My class's abilities are primarily damage enemies, but some can be modified to heal me, so I haven't found the need to use a single healing potion yet. There's dungeons and bosses that assume you're part of a group, but there's also delves which are single player dungeons. So you don't miss out on exploring dungeons if you play solo. I also haven't touched the PvP Alliance War, but it seems entirely optional. ESO has a currency system called Crowns that you can purchase with real life money. Whenever an online game has payment systems, the obvious question is whether it's paid to win. And there are some that are. Just look at the recently released Diablo Immortal. My answer for Elder Scrolls Online is no. All players must purchase the base game. That's a once-off purchase, just like a single player game. Expansions are also available, just like single player DLC. Beyond that, you can either purchase crowns whenever you want for real money, or pay a monthly fee for the ESO Plus subscription. The subscription gives you a monthly crown allowance, plus special deals in the crown store. You also get access to expansions, a 10% bump to experience, and extra storage. Nothing game changing though, the only thing I've found noticeably annoying in the base game is storage. ESO Plus players get access to a craft bag that allows them to carry unlimited amounts of crafting materials and double the storage at the bank. Since crafting materials are the majority of item types, you quickly run into the inventory limit if you try to play the game as if it was Skyrim and loot everything in sight. But as I mentioned already, you can get around that by being wise with your inventory management at the beginning. I imagine the limits will become less of a problem as you play the game and gather enough in-game gold to expand your capacity. The items in the crown store are mostly about purchasing assets to DLC areas, mounts, cosmetics, houses, and generally skipping the work needed to unlock things. For instance, you can simply purchase the same backpack limit upgrades that you can purchase with in-game gold. But using real-life money will not allow you to go over the maximum inventory size you can purchase with in-game gold. Spending crowns simply skips the work of collecting the in-game gold. The ESO Plus subscription is the only way to use real money to expand your carrying capacity beyond that. There's also a loot box system where you spend crowns to get loot boxes. I received one at the end of the tutorial, but I haven't used the system since and I don't feel I've missed anything. Basically, you do get some bonuses by spending real life money, but they don't break the game and I haven't felt the need to even look at the crown store so far other than to write this review. So can you play Elder Scrolls Online as if it was a single player game? Most definitely. You don't have to get into the multiplayer aspect at all. My only multiplayer experience has been when I run into random people and we just happen to fight the same boss at the same time. I haven't felt as if I'm playing a half-baked game at all and it's pretty clear that the game was designed to be functional for solo players. You can devote your time to just gathering resources and crafting for profit, exploring single player dungeons, doing side quests, decorating your house, and so on. As I mentioned earlier, the world seems enormous and you shouldn't lack for things to do, even if you just focus on exploration and completely ignore multiplayer. It speaks volumes that there's an explicit rule in the code of conduct against forcing role players, quote, into situations that they don't want to be in. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. Let me know what you thought about in the comments. Feel free to leave a like, subscribe and hit the bell button to be notified when new videos come out. See you soon.